friends welcome to this lecture on communication the title of today's lecture is on presupposition of human communication the notion of addressing and understanding let me introduce myself before we begin the lecture i am ranjan panda i teach philosophy in the department of humanities and social sciences iit bombay i would be talking about this seminal work of Ramchandra Gandhi, which was published in 1974 by Oxford University Press. In this seminal work, Gandhi critiques the Western theory of communication. The philosophers of language uh, who advocated uh, the theory of communication, particularly John Searle, argues that human communication is intentional and therefore, this intentionality thesis according to uh, Gandhi is based on a causal theory of intentionality. So, Gandhi is critiquing the causal theory of meaning or causal theory of communication. And as we all know broadly human communication is linguistic. We use language in our everyday life. Language is human uh, life centric. So, we are all linguistic beings. The idea here is that, that how does language carries meaning. So, uh, it is in this uh, context we need to talk about that these two questions. One, how does linguistic expression bring changes in the world? What is the nature of communicative relations? Now, these questions we would like to keep in the background of our entire lecture. Um, there are mainly three objectives of this lecture. First, we talk about the causal and the non-causal dimension of human communication. Second, what are the nuances uh, we, we can appreciate um, out of this exercise that we will be carrying out, that why communication has to be non-causal and what is the role of the notion of addressing and understanding in this non-causal framework of communication that Ramachandra Gandhi is talking about. So, at the end we aim to establish this idea that human communication is normative. Therefore, this lecture aims to establish the idea that normativity of human communication is different from mere intentional notion of communication. Language is a social phenomenon. We are all born using language, we are all linguistic beings, but what is important here is that how language represents facts, how language carries meaning. So, we use expressions and there are different kinds of expressions. Sometimes we describe facts, sometimes we make a request, sometimes we promise. So, all these are happening through language. So, therefore, human beings are you know linguistic beings, language is intrinsically connected to human life. But when it is about the description of facts, because language is a means of communication. Now, it is this means which bridges the gap between the speaker and the world, the user of language and the world. So, so language is the, is the uh, means of this re, uh, establishing this relation. So, so, therefore, it is in this context we need to keep um, in mind that how language relates uh, the world um, or how does language relate us with the world. So, so this is this is a very important question. I think we need to talk about when it uh, it is about um, description of facts. Now, uh, or the representation of facts. So there are two types of facts that I will be talking about. One is the brute fact and the institutional facts. Now these two types of facts are been uh, defined by John Searle in his theory of speech act, uh, where Searle says that there are facts or objects independent of 
uh, us. So, they exist independent of human intentionality that that is uh, for example, the, the stone exists independent of us. The stone exists independent of us in this sense that how we describe the stone depends on our, our intentionality. So, therefore, there are brute facts and meaning is about the institutional fact. So, when it is about human communication, human language use and we talk about when it is human communication and language use, we need to locate where does meaning uh, figures. So, meaning figures within an institutional framework of language use. So, therefore, meaning is an institutional fact according to Searle. So, so, if it is an institutional fact, then like all other institutional facts, it has to be a rule governed activities. So, um, or it, its existence has to be defined with reference to certain rules. So, there are two types of rules that Sal talks about. One is the constitutive rule and another is the regulative rule. Now, this whole idea of constitutive rules and meaning as an institutional fact figures in this uh, framework what language, what Searle says speaking language is a performative art according to constitutive rules. So, language as a rule governed behavior has to follow certain rules. Language as a rule governed behavior tries to show that how human activities are rule bound, how human activities are normative or guided by certain principles or certain values. Now, it is in this context we need to define what constitutive uh, rule is all about. The logic of the constitutive rule states that x counts as y in a context c. So, given a context x would be counted as, as y. So, x is meant y in a particular context. So, we would try to uh, understand that how does it happen, how does the speaker internalizes x as y in a particular context. So, that is that is how the meaning uh, emerges. The meaning emerges from this internalization of the fact that x is uh, counted as y. Now, once this rule is formed, then we need to talk about the regulative rules, how the, re the rule works. That is very simple. So, the idea here is that if there is a rule, then the rule will guide us or rule will motivate us to act in a particular way. So, for example, if I put an order, then the order has to be executed in certain um, certain form. So, so, saying that please go out or go out, if that is an order, then the hearer just executes um, the, the hearer just follows by performing and this action of going out. So, so, it is in this context we will broadly say that how meaning is been defined as an institutional fact. So, I would also try to um, tell you specifically what Searle says about Searle defines communication in this way. I quote, communication is a matter of producing effects on one's hearer, but one can intend to represent something without caring at all for the effects on one's hearer. So, this part refers to the very idea of representation. The representation means that if I want to say something, I can just say without caring for what it would mean to the hearer. The, the other part which completes this whole um, action of called communicative act, where he shall says one can make a statement without intending to produce conviction or belief in hearers or without intending to get them to believe that speaker believes what he says 
or intends without even intending to get them to understand it at all. So, the whole idea of communication involves two parts, the representational part and how the speaker means what he says. Now, when the speaker means it, he tries to induce a kind of a belief on the hearer's mind and wants that the hearer should respond to what has been stated to him. So, so, this is how communication becomes an intentional activity. You not only represent something, but also represent it in such a way that the hearer listens to it and responds to what has been said to him or her. So, so, I would just like to briefly point out that when it comes to human communication, human communication is an interpersonal uh, communication and it is an indispensable act. We will cease to be human if we do not communicate. So, there are different modes of communication. So, I would I would here take both verbal and non-verbal mode of communication into account and that is how you know uh, we can say that how communication is indispensable to human life. Um, and apart from that, the whole idea of intentionality is figuring in human communication that human communication is been intentionally articulated, it is purposive. So, in this purposive act or intentional act, we would like to understand the notion of addressing, the act of addressing and the act of understanding and how they are normatively uh, construed, how they are been normatively defined. Thank you.